They say you are what you read. Our next segment focuses on a book, a book that has nourished me over the years, E.O. Wilson's memoir, Naturalist. It's a book that's inspired millions of readers since the mid-1990s. An exciting graphic adaptation will be available in early November. And in this segment, you'll hear from E.O. Wilson himself, the creative team, and teachers who are eager to have their students read this fresh version. I wrote Naturalist in the 1990s when I was in my 60s, late in my career as an active research scientist. I wanted to tell the story of how I grew up and came to be a successful scientist and a writer. I hope to show others that it's not so far-fetched to find success in your passion. Even if that passion is something like snakes and butterflies and ants. Looking back like most people, I had both advantages and disadvantages in my youth. I try to be honest about my strengths and weaknesses. I'm gratified that readers have been inspired enough by my story that Naturalist has remained in print all these years, even enjoying a 25 year anniversary. But today, I'm really pleased to say that a graphic version with stick figures and quotations in balloons is soon going to be published. I was privileged to work with such a talented team at Island Press to adapt my stories, my memories, some of my scientific discoveries even, to the striking graphic format. My original intention and words are there on the page, but now a company with funny and evocative images. I hope that this version will find a new generation of readers, particularly young students, who might come to have some of my interests, concerns, and ambitions. At the end of this presentation, I'll return to read some excerpts from the new book. I'm really excited uh, to bring you um, an interesting creative team. Um, we're going to talk today about um, how the graphic treatment of, of E.O. Wilson's a very successful book, Naturalist, was put together. I've had the chance to look at a, a pre-publication copy. I, I think this book is connected with lots of people. I, I just, just want to say hi to my, um, to my cohort of discussants here today. Um, hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hi. Oh, I'm doing good. It's a little early, but it's, uh, I'm doing yeah. well. Good, good morning to you in Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, hi, Rebecca. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. Yeah, not so early for me. I'm over in Washington, D.C. You're in D.C., okay. And then, how about you, Jim? I'm here in Michigan. You got started. You sort of made this decision, kind of a commitment. This really is a project. Rebecca's instructions were to not depart from the book. Uh, I cheated a little <laughs> in a couple so places because I couldn't help help myself, uh, you know, pu pulled in just a couple of grace notes, I think, from some of his other books or from some of the interviews that I, ah. I listened to or saw with him. And then we get to find out what it's going to look like when a professional artist with actual skills in literally depicting something uh, does with those ideas. The fun part about doing a book like this is when Jim takes a section out of the book and it says it's Alabama 1946. Well, that place where Ed was in 1946 doesn't look anything like. You can't look up Google Maps and say, okay, that's Alabama in 1946. So now comes the internet hunt and a lot of the cities that I drew in this book came from postcards that I found huh. on the internet. Um, locations that Ed mentions come from me going through Alabama's ar photo archive, trying to find the exact street corner, trying to find what those restaurants look like. And for me, that's the fun part. Um, he did take a look at kind of batches of the roughs and um, the, the rough sketches and gave some feedback. Although usually it was along the lines of, 
you know, I didn't have a dog at this age. I had an alligator instead. So we could incorporate that um, kind which of more actually fun way thing. better, which is so yeah, much, better. much cooler. This one I pulled out because I liked how I liked how you broke broke the frame here. And I thought it might be interesting to to talk a little bit about how that came out. This, I think, was a generous a, a generous way for both Rebecca and Ed then to accept that we were going to literally put old and young or sometimes I think there, Chris, were there even occasions when there's like three ages of, uh, yeah. Yep. Which, yeah. You know, I'm sure Chris wanted to punch me in the nose across the ocean <laughs> a couple times, but for making me, uh, for suggesting that we do this. But this is one of the things that you can do in comics that is exactly. almost impossible to do in other media. I think this is a good example of, um, as since I'm someone who's more new to comics, I've read a lot of comics, but I have certainly hadn't been involved in making any before. The having multiple ads is something that I had to get used to. I wasn't quite sure about that at first, um, huh. but um, the more I worked with both Jim and Chris, um, it, it started to make a lot more sense and re a really nice visual representation of what a memoir is really, a person looking back on their life and reflecting and kind of interacting with their past self. And I'm sure students will pick out different um, ideas from a particular passage in the book and come up with something completely different. And it can also work. There's still this tendency to think, well, it's a comic book, so it's for younger people. Um, do you, like, who do you have in mind when you, when you were working on the book? Who do you hope, obviously we want everyone to read it, but did you have anyone in particular that you were hoping might be drawn to this? It's not just for a science person, it's someone who, who digs science. This, this is for someone who's interested in a new way of looking at the world. Yeah. And comics provide a new way of looking at an original text. And E.O. Wilson's life provides people with a, a great new way of looking at the world outside them. I am a nine through 12 English teacher in North Carolina. Um, and I actually work at a magnet school. So um, I have the privilege of teaching ninth grade English one, and that's more of a survey course. So a lot of options there for bringing in a variety of texts. And then I also teach a English course for our magnet program. That's more of a college prep course. And that too affords me a lot of opportunities to bring in um, contemporary texts, to bring in things beyond what we might think of the traditional literary canon. And so for me, that's one of the things that's really exciting about this project. Um, one, that it's based off of a, a prose work. So it's based off of The Naturalist. And then also it's been turned into a graphic novel. So there are a lot of possibilities there for comparison um, and for discussion about the different text types and choices. I have been a high school science teacher in Baltimore City for 11 years. I started teaching biology, um, then I moved into physics, and I've been spending the most of my time in chemistry. I have had the privilege of teaching at two very different schools. One was vocational centered, and I'm at a school now that I've been at the longest that is arts integrated, uh, project-based learning. So we're really progressive and trying to find new ways to get students engaged in the learning process. So I work with some amazing educators there and always trying to change the way we approach science. What did you like about the book? I mean, both personally and, and maybe a little bit of how do you see that, that um, students might connect um, with, with naturalists? Yeah, so I'll answer what I personally connected with first. Um, I have no experience, like the science field is not, not where I'm at at all. I do not, I believe in conservation and I applaud all of the work towards it, but I do not like even going outside, like it looks nice <laughs> from my window. Um, and so I, just on a personal level, it was really powerful and beautiful for me to read this graphic novel um, and to read about, uh, Wilson's life and how he became involved in science and just the minute details and the experiences were written in such a way that it felt not, not applicable to my own life, but very much that I understood 
um, that sense of wonder and that sense of discovery and also that desire to keep learning because those are things that I do I do possess. I don't want to go and find pick up ants at all, but <laughs> I just I like that idea of wonder and being excited about things. Um, and also being very humble in, in that journey um, and in that learning. So that, that resonated with me personally. As far as a, an educator, I think um, what was really important is some choice that some of the visual choices made. And mm -hmm. in, in our earlier conversation, I talked about um, certain choices made by the illustrators and by the graphic novelist of having scientific names for things. I thought that was such a cool, you know, that's something that you see in like a science textbook, right? You don't see it in graphic novels are different than comic books, but you don't see it in, you know, in comic books. And so I thought that choice was really interesting. Um, and I thought the play with some of the panels and carrying um, images off into the, it's called a, a bleed, but bringing them all out of the panel. Um, and I thought that there was a lot of room for conversation with students. And because it's visual, it allows us, those conversations to feel more accessible to students who perhaps view themselves as struggling readers um, who, who might not normally engage in a, a prose text. And so yep. those are a couple of things that I just, in reading personally, I thought about how I could bring it back to my yeah. classroom. And I should say opportunities for conversation that other texts aren't awarding me when I try to integrate them into a science classroom. So finding engaging reading that is actually nonfiction, you know, and, and in this sense is really unique. And in addition to the idea that you're exploring that beautiful like wonder and curiosity that I believe is the best part of science. Yeah. There's so much that I think translates into that social emotional development. So many of my students I have, you know, in, in the years have talked to them like, well, I can't be a scientist, like, or my life is difficult and I have these hardships and I'm not sure that I'll be able to become, you know, the thing I hope to be. And I think what this book can do and what I'm hoping to incorporate back into my classroom is the idea that our experiences are, are the adults in our life, the place we grow up, the education system that we're a part of, all of it shapes who we are and it doesn't hinder us from becoming what we want to be. And I think that engaging students in conversation around the experiences that shape them and their journey towards whatever their passion may be, while also including the science and the Latin terms and finding ways to engage in, you know, I think of arts integration right away with like design your own page for a graphic novel and include little science words like go home take a picture and like where can you label you know the the genus and the class or the family in this in this picture so i'm thinking of a lot of ways that it can be a you know cross curricular dream for a team to try to work on as well as differentiating i also feel like it can bring mm -hmm. in a lot of students that may even feel strong in english but check out in science or vice versa and build that confidence when it comes to yeah. engaging in scientific experiences race was emphatically not on the official boy scout agenda all the boys in the handbook for boys were white and so were all the scouts I knew. New troops formed all the time, though, and I was invited to give a short talk to one just starting up in a black rural area near Bruton in South Alabama. I did not feel pride in the example I was supposed to show. I felt shame and was depressed for days afterward. I knew in my heart that these boys would have Few real advantages, no matter how gifted they were or how hard they worked, I knew that uh, the doors were open to me, were shut to them. Then I gradually forgot about the matter. What could I do? My mind was on other things. I was filled with ambition and anxiety and did not have a strong social conscience. Civil rights activists who risked their lives to break segregation nevertheless were heroes to my liking. Single, for a moral code, physically courageous and enduring. I was impressed by them. They made me look 
again at my own social heritage. But I cannot claim to have been a liberal as a boy and a young man, certainly not one with as much foresight or courage. I, I will just say that this, this exact moment in the book is one of those moments that I was referencing earlier. That idea that you are pulled in different ways by the experiences that shape you, but also having those outward social pressures playing into your development. And I, I just felt, especially between like this scene and that next scene, how many people in those really important developmental stages can feel fall victim, you know, can feel these things and then not know what to do with those feelings. Mm. And I think as far as having a conversation with students, I think it'd be amazing to talk to Ed about it, obviously. Um, but having conversations with students about something like this could really be a great lesson in itself. If whether it's through English, through writing, or, you know, through just dialogue in class, I think this is a great place to allow students to express maybe their what if, how would you have, you know? The conversations surrounding those two pages are, are like timely given our, our current world, if you will. And so I do think it's really interesting to discuss, again, we talked about time, we talked about reflection, we talked about humility and demonstrating humbleness. And I think that is really important that there is this moment of reflection here that is in, it's not, it's not something that if I'm saying, okay, tell me about how you became this well-known scientist and this well-recognized scientist, this isn't a moment that I would say, oh yeah, this is going to be in there and yet it's included. And what is the reason that this is being included? And I think there's a big, to build off of what we were just discussing, I think there's a big moment of acknowledging the past in order to move forward and be be better and be a more like more of who you are meant to be. But if you do not acknowledge the events in your past that did directly or indirectly shape you, then you can never like fully fulfill. And I think it's just, it is really important. Again, like I was thinking a lot about that, the activity that you see all the time of like draw a picture of a scientist because we're trying to break those, you know, those assumptions in, in students. And right. here, I think this is important. Tamara, you mentioned earlier, like the word brave. And I was like, yeah, if I was drawing a picture of a scientist, like, is that a quality I'm going to depict? No, I'm going to, I'm going to draw the glasses and I'm going to mm -hmm. draw the lab coat. Like, let's be serious. But then here, like brave and humble and realizing like, wrongs that were made and how do we write those wrongs because that's true in an experiment but it's also true in life. To talk with such great teachers like you, um, you know, your students, your schools, your communities are so lucky to have you. Um, but anyways, I just want to, in a much smaller scale, thank you for taking the time uh, to, to, to discuss this uh, graphic naturalist. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to see this amazing book. So thank you. Absolutely. It was, as I said before, it was a privilege. I love being in a room with smart people. That's, that's, <laughs> you don't want to be the smartest person in the room and you learn so much and that's yeah. what happened right now.